Yo, what's up, guys? Alf here, and today I'm going to be doing a set review for Outlaws of Thunder Junction for both Historic and Explorer. Now, quick heads up, this set review is mainly going to be focused on Historic. First of all, because there are a number of cards like Stoneforge Mystic here that are going to be legal in Historic and not Explorer, which I think are some of the more high-impact cards that are entering the format. And also because a lot of the cards from the main set I think are more likely to have a bigger impact in Historic than Explorer, but whenever a card does have Explorer applications, I'll be going over that as well. And now, before I get into it, there's going to be a link down in the description if you're a premium member for a, an article that came out earlier today going over five historic theorycraft decks that I've put together built around new cards from this set. So if you're a premium member and you play historic, definitely recommend checking that out. I'll have a link to that down in the description. But anyway, let's just get straight into it. So as usual, rather than just going through the entire set and talking about every card, what I've done is basically just gone through, pulled out any cards that I think could have impact, starting with the cards that I think are likely to have more of an immediate impact, and then moving more towards the fringe stuff as we go. So anyway, let's just get straight into it. Starting off here with a really iconic card. So Stoneforge Mystic, like I mentioned, is going to be legal in Historic but not Explorer, and I'm really excited to play with this one. This is a card that I've really wanted to play with on Arena for a long time, and I think in Historic the best home for this is definitely going to be the Hammer Time deck. So Hammer Time hasn't really been a big deck in the format for quite a while now, and I think that's mainly just due to lack of consistency. So obviously for Hammer to go off you need to set up one of your big equipments like Colossus Hammer or Belt of Giant Strength, alongside an equip cost reducer like Kemba's Outfitter or Sagada's Aid, and a good creature to equip it to. So kind Kind of like a three-piece combo in a way and having to you know set all of that up in the face of uh, you know cheap removal discard spells and counter spells has been quite difficult but i think stoneforge mystic is going to be a really big boost of consistency because it's both a creature that you can equip the hammer to and a good way to tutor the hammer itself so first of all having four stoneforge mystic four colossus hammer in your deck probably means that you don't need to run belt of giant strength anymore which is a pretty big deal i think in the past in order to consistently find your big equipment you kind of needed to run four colossus hammer four belt of giant strength which meant splashing green and splashing green in your white deck doesn't really provide you any other benefits outside of maybe something like a haywire might so it kind of put you in an awkward spot where you either had to play white green and you got minimal use off the green splash or you go three colors like i did with my bant deck a while ago and the mana base in those sorts of decks is pretty horrendous you have to run a bunch of shock lands and stuff like mana confluence which is really painful so running stoneforge mystic like i said means that you probably don't need to run belt of giant strength anymore which means that you can either go mono white and have really really good mana have stuff like for blink moth nexus in your mana base maybe even more utility lands or you can just go into a more useful splash like blue for example and have really good mana as well i think if you're running just blue white you can just run a bunch of the good blue white jewel lands and still have room in the mana base for something like blink moth nexus as well so that's one area that is really going to improve as well uh, additionally it allows you to run some other equipment as utility ones so for example shadow spear is a really important equipment to have access to in certain matchups particularly against aggro decks just to swing you life back straight away and just being able to that run that as a one-off of stoneforge mystic is absolutely huge there's also other utility equipment that you can run as well like if you are in blue white which i think is the best way to build hammer going forwards because you get stuff like spell pierce and invisible stalker you can also run stuff like the reality chip as well so really excited for this in hammer now i've when i've been theory crafting this this i have been going back and forth on whether it's correct to run lurus or not my gut tells me that it is lurus is just so so powerful and it also enables you to get you know, your hammer back from the graveyard if the opponent kills it or hits it with a discard spell if you're running ornithopter and retrofit a foundry you have that loop that you can do as well so my gut says that Lurus is going to be too good not to run but there are a number of other more expensive equipments that make me think it could be worth trying builds without Lurus. So first of all is Cryptic Coat. I think Cryptic Coat is really, really good with the Stoneforge Mystic, not just as a way to grind into longer games, but I think Cryptic Coat is especially good in Hammer, because it's a 3-2 Ward 2 that also can't be blocked. So in a lot of ways Cryptic Coat is like a tutorable invisible stalker in Hammer, which is really, really sick. Then additionally, another new card that we're getting from the set that works very well with Stoneforge Mystic is Assimilation Aegis, which is basically kind of like an Oblivion ring that's tutorable right this is an unconditional removal spell for creatures and then if you equip it to your creature that creature becomes a copy of whatever you've exiled which can be relevant you know if you exile a big creature like a shielded for example then get turning your creature into a shielded is going to be pretty big as well so getting these two off stoneforge mystic is very appealing and you also get stuff like forge anew which you could run as a one or two of which then gives you a high density of equip cost reduces makes you less reliant on your Kemba's outfitter and your um 
Sigarda's Aid, which should improve consistency a little bit. And then in previous builds, I've also considered running something like Ranger Captain Evios, which can tutor your Kemba's Outfitter, can tutor Giant Killer as a removal spell, can tutor Ginger Brute as an unblockable creature as well. So I think there are reasons to not run Lurus, and I'll definitely be testing both of them out. But either way, really excited to be playing Stoneforge Mystic in Hammer. Uh, in terms of other shells that you could run Stoneforge Mystic in, in the past, I have tried builds out with the Swords and Fervent Champion and Frodo Determined Hero as ways to really miss mitigate the big weakness of the swords which is that they're a big mana investment to have to equip now those decks haven't really been too competitive but they are so much fun and stoneforge mystic did feel like the sort of card that those decks were missing as well so that's somewhere else that i'm going to be testing stoneforge mystic but either way really really excited to try this out in hammer time in historic uh, so next up we got Slickshot Show Off, which is a card I'm really excited for. This card is going to be able to force through an absolute ton of damage if you're running a Spellslinger deck. And then the ability to plot this as well also makes it more resilient against interaction, which is pretty big. So if you are playing against an opponent and you think they're, they're holding up a removal spell, you can just plot this, you know, wait till your next turn and then cast it with mana to back it up. Like if you're running a deck with Spell Pierce, you can use it to defend your creature like that. Or potentially if you're running a deck with Flame of an All, like is it Wizard, which I think will be the most natural home for this, you can guarantee a Wizard in place so that you can get both both modes of flame of an for example or you can just snow, uh, slow roll it as well if you are playing against an interactive heavy deck and they're continuously ho holding open mana for something like a fatal push you can just plot this leave it plotted maybe expressive iteration and just force the opponent to continuously burn their mana holding open removal which seems pretty big so like i mentioned i think the most natural home for this is going to be an is it wizards the issue there is that i think that deck is already pretty tight so i'm not sure what the best cuts would be to make room for this i think the the first one that comes to mind would be balmore but balmore does feel a a pretty important role in that deck in giving your board trample which is very relevant and also is another way that you can boost the power of your dreadful arcanist so that it can flash back stuff like expressive iteration and flame of an orb but i think this card is so powerful that i could very well see builds that ditch Bil balmore entirely to run this it just seems really strong to me so i'm not sure the best way to build it is it was the i the other kind of um slight non-synergy between this and the is it was his deck is that deck wants to be running reckless charge in the main deck and this already having haste means that you're not going to get full value off that compared to something like Balmore. But having said that, if you have a slick shot show off and you target it with the Reckless Charge, you're getting a plus five bonus to your attack out of nowhere, which if the opponent doesn't have a blocker, is still capable of forcing damage through. So I think this card is going to be really good. I wouldn't be surprised if this does replace Balmore and it Wizards, but we'll have to see. Like I said, the trample off Balmore is pretty nice. And then there are other decks that could potentially run this as well. You know, we've not really seen a prowess deck in Historic just because I think Wizards does that style of gameplay a lot better can grind into the longer games more easily but this is also another consideration you could run in something like is it phoenix perhaps now having said that if you compare it to a card like ledger shredder shredder is more appealing because it can help you ditch your phoenixes gives you another discard outlet but that is another you know shell that i could see running this if you wanted to run more of a low to the ground aggressive creature package with maybe drc symmetry sage in this as just a way to force through a bunch of extra damage but either way this card seems really good and i'm definitely going to be trying out in wizards when the set drops and then next up we got Satoru the Infiltrator and I think this card is sick. The The ceiling on this card is so so high. So this is a really strong card advantage engine that basically draws you cards whenever a non-token creature enters the battlefield and no mana was spent to cast it. So the first time I'm thinking of with this card is Ninjas. So Ninjas is obviously already a top tier deck in the format and this is a ninja itself and not only does this draw you cards every time you ninjutsu but it also draws you cards every time you cast Ornithopter. So if you go you know Satoru into Ornithopter or you have an Ornithopter in play and then you ninjutsu it and then recast it you can start drawing a bunch of cards now my main hesitation with this card in ninjas is that it you know it might be a little bit win more in the fact that you're only drawing cards when you're getting your ninjutsus off and when you're getting your ninjutsus off you're normally in a good position anyway additionally this isn't a card that you want to use with the ninjutsu abilities because you want it on the battlefield so having to spend ten uh, turn two casting this instead of using removal or your ninjutsu abilities might make me think that it's a little bit win more if you're just trying to slot it straight into the current builds of ninjas but i would be i'd be shocked if this doesn't see play in some form of ninjas going forwards because we've seen from builds that are running ingenious infiltrator how strong the you know snowbally card advantage tools can be in that sort of tempo deck and this is a card that does a similar thing but also enables you to keep running lurus which is a pretty big part of that deck as well uh, in terms of other shells that i could see this scene play in the first one that comes to mind is sacrifice because sacrifice decks are really good at recurring creatures from the graveyard so obviously this just pops off with cat oven so you know maybe you could consider splashing blue in uh you know ragdoll sacrifice in explorer perhaps 
Then obviously in Historic, we've got stuff like Goblin Bombardment as well. And then another new card that we're getting in the format that also works very well in the Sacrifice Shell is Forsaken Miner. I think this works very well with both Mayhem Devil and Goblin Bombardment because you can obviously sacrifice a creature, target the opponent with Bombardment or Mayhem Devil, then just play black to bring this back again. And then if you're also running Satori, you, you draw a card whenever you do that as well. Now having said that, Splashing Blue in the Ractal Sacrifice Shell definitely comes at a pretty big cost. So again, not 100% sure, but this seems like such a powerful card advantage engine for such a cheap mana cost as well that I would be shocked if some deck doesn't start abusing it. And this is definitely a card that I'm going to be trying really hard to break in both Historic and Explorer. And so next up we've got Surgical Extraction, which is a card that's going to be legal in Historic, but not Explorer. And this card seems like a really, really solid sideboard card against the graveyard-based strategies. So with the printing of Treasure Cruise, Phoenix has definitely been on the upswing in Historic recently. And this seems like such a brutal card against Phoenix. Just cast it for free, exile all of the opponent's Phoenixes, and then, you know, half their deck is, is gone straight away. Same thing against Kethys as well. If you can use this to exile a Mox Amber and then exile all the Mox Ambers from the opponent's deck, it basically just stops them from combining going off entirely which is brutal as well and then against decks like reanimator you can obviously use it to get rid of their attractor and then they've got you know you got rid of all of their reanimation targets so surgical does seem like it's going to have a big impact on the format and this seems like a card that can really push all three of those decks and also you know other graveyard decks if people are trying to run dredge for example which is another deck you can consider running satoru in because it draws you cards whenever you bring stuff back from the graveyard this just seems like a card that's really going to keep those sorts of graveyard strategies in check and basically every deck can run it because it's you know Phyrexian mana and so next up we've got Prismatic Vista so this is another card that's going to be legal in Historic but not Explorer and this is a huge deal in Historic because it's the very first good quality fetch land that we're getting so off the bat I don't think this makes cards good that are reliant on fetch lands like Deathrite Shaman for example because you can only run this as a 4 of so you're not going to be able to consistently find it in the early game which is you know you really want to get fetch lands consistently in the first couple turns for Deathrite Shaman to be good because you can use it as a ramp tool which is where the main power comes from but this is going to be a really big boost to cards that are already playable but get better with fetch sands so for example sacrifice decks are really going to like this because it makes blood ghast significantly better right you can go you know if you have blood ghast and goblin bombardment you can sack the blood ghast ping something play the prismatic vista get it back sacrifice it ping something else crack the fetch land get it back ping something else as well and then it obviously works very well with mayhem devil like we've seen in the past some old sacrifice decks used to run fable passage and this is significantly better there i also think it's a really big deal in is it phoenix because it's a way that you can get delirium online easier for Dragon's Rage Chandler and also fills your graveyard for Treasure Cruise, right? Treasure Cruise incredibly powerful with Fetch Sands, so that's going to be another nice addition there. And I also think that some mid range decks are really going to like this as well because it's a way we can trigger Revolt on Fatal Push more easily, which is something that certain decks have struggled to achieve a lot in the past. And then obviously, good with Tarmogoyf as a way to get more land types in the graveyard quickly. And then also very nice with Croxer if you're running that as well. So I definitely think that this is going to be a really big boost for decks that, or, or specifically cards that are already playable but become better with the addition of fetch sands, basically. So next up we've got Jace Reawakened, which is one of my favourite cards from the set. And again, this one has been very difficult to evaluate because it's the first two mana Planeswalker that we're getting on Arena, and it's the very first spell that we get that we can't cast before turn four, both of which are pretty big, but I'm really excited with this card, and my instinct is that this card is going to be good in both formats. I'm really excited to start playing with this. So first of all, two mana Planeswalker means that we can run it alongside Luris, which obviously isn't relevant in Explorer because it's banned there, but in Historic, that is very relevant, right? We have seen Luris control decks in the past. Haven't really seen them too much recently since the banning of, or the, sorry, the nerfing of Orcish Bowmasters, but if you do choose to run a Luris control deck, then Jay seems like a really solid addition there. Uh, outside of that, I do think this is just a good, a good tool in control in general, because the obvious downside of not being able to cast it until turn 4 isn't too much of a downside in control where you want to continuously hold the open mana, you know, especially where we have No More Lies now as a good 2 mana counter spell, and then in Historic we also have Reprieve, you know, you can hold open mana on turn 2, hold open mana on turn 3, and then on turn 4 you can cast Jace and then still hold 2 mana open as well, which is a pretty big deal, so I do think that it does seem strong enough that it could potentially just see play fairly as a good planeswalker in control and then also as i mentioned in the time of set review video it works very well with valky god of lies because if you have a jason play and you use this other plus one you can plot valky god of lies and then cast it on the tybalt side for free the following turn which is a really big deal gives you a very powerful top end that also enables you to continuously hold open mana right you can go jace on turn four plot the valky 
untap on turn 5, hold all of your mana open, cast the Valky and start snowballing the game pretty hard as well. And with all the card selection and card advantage that control decks have access to, you can get away with Val just running Valky as a, as a 2 of because that is the biggest downside of having to run this. Valky as a card on its own isn't particularly good, but just running it as a 2 of in a control deck, you'll, you'll most likely find it when you're trying to dig for it once you already have a J. So this is a pretty interesting interaction that I'm very excited to try out in both maybe Demir and Esper control decks in both formats. I, I definitely think this card could have potential to see play. Again, it's a very difficult card to evaluate because it's pretty unlike any card that we've we've seen so far, but I, I'm personally very optimistic about this card and I'm really excited to try it out in control in both Historic and Explorer. And then next up we got Gerald the Flesh Rite, which is a really interesting card. This is obviously very re reminiscent of Monastery Mentor, and that's the main home I'm excited for. So I think out of the two formats, I'm generally much more excited for Gerald in Historic, because I can kind of envisage a... Uh, a deck that is basically running four Monastery Mentor, four Geralf, and then you can run four Unearth and four Helping Hand as kind of cheap ways to reanimate them from your graveyard, and then immediately start casting cheap spells in order to produce a bunch of tokens and really get advantage straight away. Because the weakness of these sorts of cards, if you just tap out for them on turn three, if they then just kill get killed by a removal spell, that's a real blowout for you. So having one mana ways to consistently reanimate these, and then have a bunch of cheap spells to trigger them straight away, seems like a really powerful way to just, you know, completely overwhelm the opponent on the board. So the reason I'm more excited for this in Historic is because we have Unearth there, so you can run for Unearth for Helping Hand as just a cheap way to reanimate these three drops. Then there's obviously an, a number of other powerful three mana, uh, three mana creatures that you can run to reanimate, and then you can run stuff like Tainted Indulgence and maybe Faithful Mending as ways to get these into the graveyard going into your turn three. So I'm really excited to try those decks out. I do think they could still be playable in Explorer, but not having as high a redundancy for your Helping Hand style effect makes me a little bit less high on it there but i'm really excited to try this out in historic because i've not really tried monastery mentor decks out there and this does seem powerful enough to see play in those sorts of shells for sure uh, so next up we got Reckless Lackey, which I think could be a really big deal for Historic Muxus Goblins. So in Historic, there's kind of two different ways that you can build goblins. You've obviously got the combo variant with Cabaretti Revels, which I still think is a very good deck. My issue with that list, though, is that the difference in quality of your hands when you have the Revels and you don't is pretty big, so there's definitely a layer of inconsistency there. And then the other way you can build it is focusing on Muxus. So the Muxus builds of goblins hasn't really been a big deck in Historic for quite a long time now, and I think the big reason why is just the, the biggest structural issue with those decks is that you just don't have good quality one drops right you've obviously got skirk prospector but the next best one drop after that is significantly worse so you've kind of either got to run subpar one drops uh removal spells at the one drop slot which then makes muxus worse or just not run any other one drops at which point your curve is really clunky and you're running kind of a slow deck and you know historic as a format has sped up a lot since that style of goblins was last viable as well so i think just a lack of good one drops is the main reason why that version of the deck hasn't seen much play and i think reckless lackey could potentially be that next good one drop to run alongside skirk prospector because you know one two first strike haste is whatever you know that's might be relevant in certain matchups, but it's the activated ability here that I'm pretty excited about. So, sacrifice this on turn three, draw a card, and create a treasure token. So, this is basically a one drop that can ramp into Muxus later in the game, which is a really big deal because the main three ways that you've got ramping into Muxus are obviously Skirk Prospector, Cost reducers like Goblin Warchief and Goblin and Archimancer and treasure tokens. And I think the first two are a little bit of a liability because they're, they're very... Um, vulnerable to interaction right prospector dies very quickly especially something like goblin war chief which is a three mana card that if it gets killed is such a blowout for you same thing with goblin and archimancer and so treasure tokens of cards like wily goblin have always been very valuable because they're less um they're less vulnerable to interaction. Now, obviously, Reckless Lackey can be killed before turn three, but you're much happier if the opponent kills your one drop than if they kill your War Chief as a three drop, if that makes sense. And if they don't kill it, you can have curves without Prospector where you go Lackey on one, Wily Goblin on two, sacrifice this on turn three, replace itself and creates a treasure token, and then just cast a Muxus on turn four. And especially when we got Cavern of Souls fairly recently as well, that's a really good way that you can force the Muxus through counter magic as well. So I'm really excited to try this in Muxus variants because, like I said, 
good. That deck has always been missing good one drops, and this seems like a really good one drop if your goal is to ramp into Muxus. And then next up, we got Tiny Bones the Pickpocket, which is a really interesting card, and I think this is a very potentially powerful card as well. So one mana, one one Death Touch, and whenever it connects, you can start casting non lands from the opponent's graveyard, which is a very snowball ability, especially on a one drop. And the fact this has Death Touch means that it can fairly freely attack in as well. So you could obviously consider running this in just a mid range deck, and maybe there's you know I could potentially see an argument to running this there because mid range decks have always struggled with one drops. You know in the past they've run stuff like Dragon's Rage Channeler, and this seems like if you can defend it a, a one drop that could snowball the game. But the main place I'm excited to try this out is in Demir Rogues because it is a rogue itself. So Demir Rogues has been a deck that I've always felt like has a very good core but just doesn't have enough creatures. So I think the the one drop that you can flash in and the the thought thief as well the, the kind of lord effect is very powerful as well but we have we just need more rogues good rogues to play alongside those so we recently got the uh, pickpocket prankster which i think works very well in the deck especially if you're running treasure cruise as just a way to dig towards stuff and then be able to cast a rogue and then tiny bones is another rogue that works very well with the rogues game plan because you're going to be milling the opponent over filling their graveyard so they're always going to have stuff in the yard you're also a tempo deck so you should be pretty good at both keeping the opponent off the board and defending Tiny Bones itself so that it can start connecting and snowboarding the game pretty quickly. So it seems like it will work pretty well there. In terms of the big weaknesses of Rogues, obviously there are a number of decks where milling the opponent is going to be dangerous, like against decks like Phoenix and Kethis, but with the addition of um, Surgical Extraction, I think you know, that really mitigates the big weakness of rogues, and milling the opponent against a graveyard synergy deck could also be turned into a benefit if you run surgical in, in fairly high numbers in the sideboard. So I'm definitely excited to try this out in rogues. I'm also definitely going to be trying this out in mid-range decks as well, but for a one drop, this seems like it could be quite a snowboardy threat if you have a lot of interaction to, you know, clear the way and defend it. Uh, so next up we've got Demonic Ruckus, which I think is going to be a really nice addition to the Auras deck. So Auras as an archetype hasn't really been that popular recently, but I still think it's a pretty strong deck. And I think one of the big issues with that deck traditionally has been a lack of good things to do on turn one. Nowadays that's less of an issue because you've obviously got good options like Esper Sentinel, Giver of Runes, and Skrelv and stuff like that. But the ability to plot this on turn one gives you something else good to do on turn one. And it also enables you to get immediate value off your Auras creatures. So if you go plot this on turn one into spirit dancer you can immediately equip it and just get a card draw straight away um if the opponent doesn't have a removal spell and they're reliant on red damage based removal that obviously buffs the core spirit dancer out of range of that straight away and then with stuff like light pause as well you can immediately get something like kaya's ghost form to give it protection or whatever else you want to find on it so the fact that this gives you something good to do on turn one and immediately gets value off your auras creature so it's very very punishing if the opponent doesn't have a removal spell up at instant speed this seems like a really nice addition to that deck and i'm excited to try it out uh then next up we got ruthless lawbringer which isn't a card that i think is going to see play in multiples in the main deck i'm more excited for this as a chord of calling tutor target in combo decks like amalia and explorer and then you know samwise and yorgmoth in historic so again i think this is mainly just going to be a tutor target but being able to search this and then sacrifice one of your other creatures just to kill any permanent seems like really nice flexibility as part of your chord of calling toolbox and then next up we got path to exile so this is a card that's going to be legal in historic and not explorer and this is a very interesting addition to Historic because we obviously do have Fragment Reality as a one-mana removal spell, but that obviously does have a pretty big downside if you use it on a creature that costs two or more, especially if you're playing a control deck, right? Having to use Fragment Reality and the opponent just getting another creature instead is a pretty big deal. So having Path to Exile as another option at the one-mana removal spell slot is pretty nice, especially if you didn't want to have to pay extra for something like Get Lost. Obviously, the big downside of Path to Exile is giving the opponent a land is a drawback, especially if you have to use it in the early game. So if you do want one-mana removals specifically for turn one against the deck like Is It Wizards, for example, then Fragment Reality reality is obviously much better but if giving the opponent a creature is a big issue like it can be in control then path to exile is definitely an option to consider so very nice options for blue white control and then obviously white decks in general right they could be some white aggressive decks that want to have access to this as just a way to deal with bigger creatures where giving the opponent a land isn't that much of a big deal if you are playing an aggressive deck so we'll have to see but either way it's just nice to give you know the the white decks an extra option in their toolbox for removal and then next up we got grand abolisher which is another interesting addition to the format so this is obviously going to be at its best against control decks or just decks in general 
general that rely on interacting at instant speed, especially decks relying on counter spells. And so I don't think this is really going to see play in the main deck unless it's, you know, part of a combo deck where you really want to defend against counter spells. But in the sideboard, I definitely could see a few homes for this. So first of all, it's a human, which, you know, humans are a deck in, in both formats. Having said that, I think humans are one of the de decks that have the best matchup against control already because they have a lot of taxing effects like, you know, Esper Sentinel and Thalia and Elite Spellbinder and those sorts of effects. So this could be a card that doesn't see play in humans because you've already got a lot of tools to improve the control matchup. But another place I'm excited for this in, similar to Ruthless Lawbringer, is Court of Calling decks where you just want to be able to defend your combo. So we've obviously got Yorgmoth, you've got Samwise, you've got Amalia combo, all Court of Calling decks that want to be able to protect their combo from instant speed interaction. So you could potentially, you know, pass to the end of the opponent's turn, Court for X equals 2 if you've got the combo in your hand, get Grand Abolisher, and then <clears throat> the opponent either has to kill the Grand Abolisher, which might take them off interaction for your combo, or if the turn passes to you, you're, you're just free to, to combo off. So I'm definitely excited to try this out, mainly in Court of Calling toolboxes, but you, you maybe you could see this in the sideboard of, of human stacks going forwards as well. Uh, then next up we got Mind Slaver, so another really iconic card, and this one again is going to be legal and historic but not Explorer, and I don't think that's really going to matter because the only place I really see this seeing play is in the Wishboard of Khan decks, and obviously Khan is banned in Explorer, so if you're running Monogreen Devotion, this is an option you could consider running in your Khan Wishboard. Now having said that, if you've got access to 10 mana, you've already got a lot of really good options in the Khan Wishboard, I think there are a lot of games where Portal to Phyrexia, Cityscape Lever, and particularly a Chroma's Memorial will just win you the game. I'm not sure if there are really many spots where a Kramer's Memorial won't win you the game and Mind Slaver will. If that does come up, then it could be worth considering there. Additionally, you know, if you have access to a ton of mana and you've got Khan and Cure, you could obviously do the Pestilent Cauldron Leaps to win as well. So I'm not sure if this is really necessary. If there are spots where, you know, Memorial won't win and Mind Slaver will, then obviously you could consider it as well. But tight, the space is already quite tight in the wishboard, so I wouldn't really be surprised if this doesn't see play in Monogreen Devotion, but it's an option to consider. Uh, so next up we've got Avon Interrupter, and this is one of my favorite cards from the set. I'm really excited to play with this one. So this is kind of reminiscent, kind of like a crossover between Spell Queller and Elite Spellbinder. So 2-2 two, two Flash Flyer that when it ETBs you can plot a card that's on the stack and then it costs two more to cast as long as Avon Interrupt is on the battlefield. So I'm really excited to play with this one. I think it's actually better than Elite Spellbinder in a lot of ways because you force the opponent to invest the mana up front and then tax the card on top of it whilst getting a threat into play yourself as well. Uh, I also want to give a shout out to NM who commented on my uh, Timeless set review video when I talked about this, who uh, mentioned that if you use this against a counter spell, it basically makes it completely redundant, because if something is plotted, you can only cast it at sorcery speed. So if you use this on an instant, it forces the opponent to cast it during their turn only, which is another really big deal and another big upside of this card. So this seems like a really big tempo card. You can obviously also blink it at instant speed with something like Ephemerate to essentially counter something else. And then additionally, the, the, you know, the static on this is meant to tax the the stuff that you hit, but the spells your opponents ca uh, cast from graveyards f cost two more is also relevant against a deck like Kethis combo, for example. So this not only works as a nice tempo tool, but can also be a hate card against decks that are trying to loop stuff from the graveyard as well. So I'm really excited to play with this one. Uh, so next up we got Fibble Thip Lost on the Range. So this is a really cool card. It's a three mana one one with board two and you can look at the top card of your library at any time, and you can plot cards from the top of your library, so it's kind of like a future site, but you have to wait a turn to cast the cards, and also if you, like I mentioned with Avon Interrupter, if you have instant speed stuff like counter spells, it also doesn't work super well, but in general future site cards don't work well with counter spells anyway, so that's not really a big deal. So I think this card is very generically powerful, right? It gives you a very good tool to grind into longer games for sure. My big issue with this card is that I just don't think it really has a good home, right? I think if you are going to run this card, it's probably in a collected come company deck because it's a three drop but there aren't really many value collected company decks that are good enough so this feels like a card that maybe could be a good sideboard card if you're playing a blue creature deck or if you're playing a collected company in blue uh, sorry a collected company deck in blue uh, for grindier matchups to allow you to pull ahead on times of card advantage so i feel yeah like i said i feel like this is a card that's powerful enough to see play in the format but it just doesn't have a good home right now so definitely one that's going to be on my radar going forwards and then next up we've got scorching shot so this isn't a very exciting card but i think it does fill a very important role so Obviously, mono red decks, the big weakness of having to run damage based interaction is that you can struggle to kill bigger creatures. The, the, the main ones that are relevant in the format right now are stuff like Shieldred and Vein Ripper. And typically, these sorts of 
two mana red damage spells that deal five require some other cost as well. You've got stuff like Shrapnel Blast, which requires you to be playing artifacts you can sacrifice. you got Lightning Axe that requires you to discard a card. So if you are playing mono red and you just want a sideboard card to be able to answer the bigger creatures like Shielded and Vein Ripper, you now got Scorching Shot that's just, you know, two mana, kill the big creature without any other setup. Obviously being Sorcery Speed as opposed to Instant is a drawback, but if you're running a mono red deck without the synergies to enable something like Shrapnel Blast or Lightning Axe, this is definitely one to bear in mind for your sideboards. Uh, so next up we got Duelist of the Mind, which is obviously Nathan Stoy's World Championship card, and this card's really interesting to me, so obviously very reminiscent of Ledger Shredder, and I think if this does see play, it is likely going to be an Is It Phoenix, which is a deck that's already running for Faithless Looting for Treasure Cruise, so it should be pretty easy for you to buff its power pretty quickly, you know, especially because you're running a bunch of other cantrips that draw as well, which is pretty nice. Bowmasters isn't really a factor in the format anymore, and a lot of the, um, the Rakdos style decks are moving away from Shieldred in favour of Sora and Vayne Ripper as well. So there aren't too many cards in the format that punish you drawing a lot so you can, you know, max out on considers, max out on ops to be able to to buff this card's power very quickly. My main concern with this compared to Ledger Shredder is that I do still think it's easier to connive than it is to commit crimes because Phoenix doesn't really run stuff that can go face so for you to commit crimes you need to be using removal spells on the opponent's creatures when this is in play. But having said that I think Historic as a format is pretty creature centric at the moment anyway so maybe that's not really a big deal. Either way, I'm definitely excited to try this one out in Phoenix and time will tell whether it's better than Shredder or not. And then next up we got Requisition Raid. So this is one that I think is going to be a, a solid option for your sideboard. So having a removal spell that can kill artifacts, enchantments, and both if you pay extra is pretty appealing, right? Typically to destroy artifacts and enchantments if you want to have access to both, it does typically cost you two mana anyway. And so even if you only use this to kill one or the other, it seems reasonable for the mana cost. Obviously being sorcery speed as opposed to instant is a little bit awkward, but having the flexibility and the option to use both seems pretty nice. And then you can obviously use this to buff your board in certain spots as well, so especially if you're running an aggro deck and you want a sideboard card for artifacts and enchantments, this seems like a super flexible option because being able to pay 3 mana, destroy an artifact, and put a plus 1 plus 1 counter on all of your creatures seems really nice, so I'm definitely excited to play this in the sideboard of white decks, particularly aggressive creature strategies. Uh, so next up we've got Final Showdown, which is another very interesting spree card, and I think for this one to be good, you need to be running a deck that can consistently utilize at least 2 of these abilities, so for example, if you're running a Death Shadow deck, the ability to have creatures lose all abilities means that your Death Shadow will instantly go up to a 13-13, and the ability to give a creature indestructible means that you can protect your creatures as well, so that's maybe one potential home. Then, it's also an instant speed sweeper, but 6 mana is so much in both Historic and Explorer, so I think for this to be good in a deck like Control, you would really need the all creatures lose all abilities until the end of the turn to be relevant, so, you know, if Territorial Carvey was everywhere, or, you know, if Constructs were were a common thing. Obviously, without Urza's Saga, that's unlikely. So, I think this is one that's probably not going to see too much play straight away, but as the all creatures lose all abilities until the end of the turn, becomes more relevant in the format, this definitely is a card that you should be bearing in mind going forwards. And uh, then next up, we got Abrupt Decay. So, I'm not 100% sure if this is going to be legal in Explorer or not. You'll have to let me know in the comments if you have more details on this one, because Skyfall here is saying that it's going to be legal in Historic and not Explorer, which makes sense, because I think it is one of the bonus sheet cards, which aren't going to be legal in Explorer, but... This is a card that's been legal in Pioneer for quite a while, I believe, and I thought that the wizard said that if a card is programmed onto Arena and it's legal in Pioneer, that they would also make it legal in Explorer, so I'm not 100% sure if it's going to be legal in Explorer. If you have more details, definitely let me know in the comments, I'd love to know. Um, if it is legal in Explorer, I don't think it's likely to make a huge difference, though. I think if this does see play, it's probably going to be either in a mid-range deck if you're running Golgari or Jund, or potentially in the sideboard of a deck like Greasefang, maybe, to be able to answer, you know, flex flexibly answer hate cards. Again, in Historic, I think this is a useful tool to have if you're running a mid-range deck or if you're running a green-black combo deck that wants answers to uh, flexible hate pieces, but I don't think this card is likely to have a huge impact, you know, especially compared to a format like Timeless, where this is a really nice option for, for the show-and-tell deck. And uh, then next up we got High Noon, so this is basically rule of law but a mana cheaper, and it has an upside that you can sack it to deal 5 damage to any target if you're also running red. 
Um, so this is an interesting option to have access to. I don't think it's really likely to have a huge impact in either format, to be honest. There are some decks, especially combo decks, that rely on storming off to be able to go off. Like in Historic, you've got Kethis combo, for example. But against those decks, definitely Silence does the job. You know, unlike Show and Tell in Timeless, there really isn't too much of a difference between running a card like Deafening Silence and High Noon, really. So I think this is just one that's like a card to bear in mind going forwards. And if a deck that storms off with creatures involved becomes popular, then this is a nice hate cards to bear in mind there. There are obviously some decks that you could use to build around this as well if you restrict each player to one card per turn and then you use flash threats during the opponent's turn like Reprieve, but I don't think those decks are going to be particularly good. So this seems more like a, a sideboard card that I don't expect to see play sorry, see play straight away, but it's definitely one to bear in mind going forwards. And then finally, we've got Smuggler's Surprise. So this is a card where I feel like the power level is there for sure. I'm just not sure what the best home for it is. So the ability to put two creatures from your hand onto the battlefield at instant speed is something that we've not seen in either format at all before. We've never really seen an effect similar to this in either Historic or Explorer. So that alone is very interesting to me. I think for this to be good, you need to be running a deck with big creatures that you obviously want to cheat into play, and you need to have some other way to utilize those big creatures, so I don't know whether you could run this in a reanimator deck as kind of a backup, or, you know, run it alongside Sorin and Vein Ripper, but that seems like quite an expensive way to do things, so this definitely feels like a card where it's flexible, you know, if, if you are built around cheating big creatures into play some other way, this gives you redundancy of finding those creatures and protecting them once they're already in play, and another way to cheat them in, so again, this feels like a card that I wouldn't be surprised if it was a key part of a deck in the future, but I just don't really know what the best home for it is right now. So this is definitely a card where I'd be really interested to hear what your guys' plans are for it, because this does feel like a card that if you build around it and you have another piece of redundancy to cheat these big creatures into play, it could be a very powerful deck, and it's obviously a very flexible card as well. So I'm really excited to try this out and to try and figure out a good home for it. So those are all the cards that I wanted to highlight. Definitely let me know in the comments if you think I've missed any out. I did go through the whole set and there were a few cards that I thought could potentially be worth talking about but didn't really seem powerful enough to me so if you think there's anything i've left off definitely let me know in the comments additionally if you think there's any applications of these cards that i didn't talk about definitely let me know as well um either way i hope you enjoyed the video and i'll catch you all in the next one big up